Hello, it's Jake here. Welcome to The Voluntary Life. This is the first of a series of episodes on the subject of the voluntary city. And what we mean by the voluntary city is the potential to solve urban problems by voluntary means. That is, the potential for civil society or the private sector to solve such problems as the provision of infrastructure, the planning of urban development, and many other related topics that would traditionally come under uh, the field of urban planning. The discussion that we have is based around a great book called The Voluntary City, uh, which is edited by David T. Beto, Peter Gordon and Alexander Tabarug. And Peter Gordon, one of the co-editors of the book, is a special guest in the discussion that you'll hear in this episode. Peter is a professor at the University of Southern California's School of Policy, Planning and Development. And we're also joined by Adam, Stephen and Emily, the authors of the blog Market Urbanism, which you can find at marketurbanism.com. And as the tagline says, the blog is about urbanism for capitalists and capitalism for urbanists. So in this discussion, we've brought together a whole group of people who have been involved in some way in the field of urban development, either through research or professional work, and have taken an interest in this question of voluntary means of solving urban problems. In this first episode, we talk about the background to our interest in urban development and some of the underlying issues uh, relating to urbanism and civil society. So thank you so much for listening, and I hope you enjoy the discussion. You know, m many of us who are interested in cities and the history and evolution of cities uh, live in a world where the conventional wisdom is that cities are the places where grand plans and top-down plans come into being, and where we look to local governments and we look to government edicts and things like that to guide cities. And uh, I think that's the standard view, uh, as, as far as I can tell. Um, there are very few people who look to the bottom-up activities and point out that the bottom-up activities are at least as powerful, if not more powerful, than the top-down activities, which, which get top billing. So um, I take it when I say bottom-up and top-down, that doesn't offend anybody. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. Okay, because I even get corrected on that. Um, so anyway, so there's the there's the standard wisdom that we hear all day long that uh, cities are the places which have a history of grand plans, which have a future a future of grand plans. Grand plans come out of some kind of a mysterious political process, and uh, if we can just reform that process, God knows how, then we'd have what they call livable communities, and then they have all these lovely names, livable and um, smart growth and all those things. And uh, I think the, the book that we're talking about uh, puts together a bunch of views which challenge that and which also challenge this very conventional stuff that we get all the time about what market failures are. And I think um, even... Many, many economists who listen to mainstream, so-called mainstream economists, are fond talking about market failures, the kind that's discussed in most textbooks. And um, the last chapter in The Voluntary City, about Alex Tabarrok, uh, where he kind of caps things off, he says there are all these market-challenging activities, but market-challenging and market-failing is not the same. And then the authors in the book examine, uh, on the basis of historical episode, historical fact, or contemporary, is where these are, in fact, not market failures, but there are market participants that come into play in spite of the um, this really old-fashioned market failure theory. So I'm not sure that addresses your point, but maybe it's a place to start. No, absolutely, and and uh, I I wanted to um, uh, say that um, just from from my background, I mean, I actually I was in um, sort of urban development field for some time. Um, I have since sold the business. I had a consulting business in that field, and I've since mm -hmm. sold it. But I remember very clearly uh, when I was doing my masters in property development and planning that the basic starting assumption was that cities were just essentially one big pile of market failure that the state would need to um, yes. sort out. Um, yes. Certainly, 
you know, the book, the chapters in, in the Voluntary City, the sort of historical examples of places, where, uh, of ways in which um, where an opportunity has arisen, the market itself has, has provided infrastructure and has yes. uh, um, uh, sorted out many of the problems that are considered um, market failures. These are things that I never learned about. I never had any... Um, um, sort of uh, uh, reference to to that in the in the stuff that I was was taught, and and I know that in the field, many of the assumptions about, for example, the inability of the market to provide for roads, the inability of the market to do any kind of uh, forward planning of land use and, and uh, so forth, these are things that were uh, just taken as givens by uh, most people, even people working in the private sector. So I, exactly. I think it's a fascinating book, and um, and so that's sort of one of the reasons why I found this book particularly interesting. Because as a person coming from a, a, a deep interest in market solutions um, in general, and because my background is in urban development, I, I found this um, an absolutely um, fascinating book. And I wanted to just ask, um, sort of before we get into the discussion, you know, um, the, maybe the guys from um, the, the blog Market Urbanism, would you guys like to just sort of provide a, a brief act, a background to, to what, what it is that you do um, uh, with that blog in particular? Because I think it's highly relevant um, for what Peter sort of has described as the approach um, taken in, in this book, The Voluntary City. I guess my story was basically I had free market leanings, but I was an urbanist to, to start with um, until I actually took a microeconomics class. And while I was in that class, I found myself sitting in traffic on a, you know, in a, on a tollway and realized that the tolls weren't priced high enough <laughs> based upon what I was le learning in uh, microeconomics. And then um, when I got into grad school in uh, real estate development, I started learning about all the regulations that were uh, pretty much ubiquitous in the, in the land use world. And uh, so I came to realize what, what we see isn't really a product of the free market. It's uh, pretty much uh, regulated to right. be what it is. Um, and uh, I, I, and so um, when I kind of came to that realization, it seemed like uh, I wasn't encountering a lot of people who who shared that same outlook. So I figured I, I might as well just start writing about it and see uh, see if there's other people out there that that agree. <laughs> and um, it's interesting, you know, uh, how. Um, it's attractive to people on the left who are environmentalists and, and also attractive to just the libertarians in general, I guess. Uh, right. Your, your blog is, is uh, attracting both environmentalists and libertarians, is it? Right, right. right. Great. Well, th thanks for um, providing the background. Um, I was going to say, it must, you know, I, I think it's, it's strange that um, most of the urban planners I know um, have Jane Jacobs as a as one of their you know total heroes, um, and I guess it's slightly complicated by the fact that Jane Jacobs never actually called herself libertarian, and I don't think she would even necessarily say that she was looking at things from a free market perspective. But she did very much take um, a kind of bottom up market oriented approach to understanding cities, and yet somehow that understanding exists within the context of I guess the rest of the outlook that you get in the, in the planning world, which is, um, yeah, I get sort of to be, uh, to, to take uh, regulation and, and sort of uh, state, um, a, a sort of statist approach as being, I guess, something that you don't even question that it would, there would be any other way that cities could either be built or managed or maintained or, or anything else. So um, it must be, it must be odd for you with the blog. Um, uh, sort of encountering, I guess, the mainstream urban planning world, because uh, I guess it's it's definitely not not uh, not a view that's shared within mainstream urban planning. Would you say? Well, I think I think a lot of the a lot of the ideas that Jay and Jacobs has pretty much become 
the norm the norm within the planning community at least in the more progressive circles um but there's still a skepticism of of free markets basically that's that's my opinion jake this is peter can, can i add something on that certainly please do Right. My planning colleagues would grant you that Jane Jacobs won the war with Robert Moses, at least intellectually. And having won the war with Robert Moses, they're happy to be where they are. In other words, they're looking at planning as having moved forward, progressed, since the Robert Moses view of the world. And they're happy to call it quits. I won't say call it quits, but they're happy where this puts them. It's, it doesn't put them anywhere near where I am or where we think we ought to be. But I just add that to give you the Jane Jacobs view that I hear. Yes, I think that's right. I think um, and just for people who, who uh, may not be aware, Robert Moses is a very famous um, planner from New York responsible for most of the really heavy-duty uh, 1960s-style um, infrastructure and planning that went in in, in New York. And um, I, I think you're right, um, uh, Peter, because I think, especially, for example, when I was involved in, in doing projects, um, urban development projects, advising on, on uh, movement and transport issues, those large-scale 1960s um, sort of mega plans were such an obvious failure that I think most urban planners since then have you know kind of recoiled from from what happened when uh, you know when I guess physical planning was really uh, concentrated in um, sort of um, master planning by um, by uh, state state planners and now I guess the approach is still very highly regulated but maybe a little bit less. Um, large scale in in, in single plans. I, I guess that's yes. the effect that's happened. Yes, well, right. And I think the interesting thing is, and I think this is perhaps nuanced, but I think it's an important nuance, that having moved beyond Robert Moses, who's seen as a dictator of sorts, and having involved uh, neighborhood community hearings and, uh, and various transparencies and various openness, um, people think that they now have, in fact, people are very much offended, when I contrast what I call bottom-up with, with top-down. And they say, no, 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 uh, we're not top-down anymore. We've moved beyond Robert Moses. But, of course, I, I think there's, a, there's an important distinction there, w which you mentioned, and that is that, um, you know, God knows how many community meetings we can have. At the end of the day, we still have a very politicized process. And I think that um, the question is, or the, the discussion is, how far, how far away can we get from a strictly politicized process? And I think on top of that, uh, politicized, though everything is, um, the market rears its head. And the market rears its head and often wins in spite of the best intentions of people who barely understand the market. So I think there's kind of an interesting middle ground between Robert Moses and perhaps many others, uh, which the planners now occupy, the, many of the planners occupy, which is still quite far from the kind of stuff I'm interested in the Voluntary City. Yes, absolutely. The idea that holding a, um, a local consultation meeting where, right. you know, members of the community can basically get up and voice their views. The idea that that is the same as a market process is sort yes. of, you know, it's just crazy. Yes. But actually, people think that that means participation, whereas obviously in, in, in a real market process, everyone essentially gets to vote with their wallets in the way that they, you know, make choices and the impact that that has on, on the way that, uh, you know, land uses and everything else develops. So Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I wondered um, if, if does anybody else. Uh, I, I was going to um, ask Peter about some of the ideas in this book, but does anybody else want to jump in and uh, and add anything on, on what we're saying? If you if you do, please. Uh, yeah. Please do so. Hi, this is this is Stephen from Market Urbanism. Hi. Um, Good. I 
Regarding Jane Jacobs, I had two things to say. First of all, when um, when Adam was talking about, you know, or uh, I don't remember who it was, someone was talking about how Jane Jacobs sort of disavowed the ideas of libertarianism. I, I remember this one quote where someone asked her, you know, do you consider yourself a libertarian? And she said no, and then all the reasons she gave were completely not related to urbanism. You know, it was, I don't know, about health care and education and, th- you know, things that are sort of only tangentially related. So, I mean, there's a kind of interesting literature of libertarians trying to own her or not trying to own her, but... um. I guess I think what she moved us towards, you know, with regards to Robert Moses, is we've moved from a planning process that was um, a top-down one, interested mostly in moving cars from one place to another very quickly, to one that sort of enforces, um, I guess the the stereotype would be Jane Jacobs' Greenwich Greenwich Village. It sort of imposes whatever urbanism happens to be there because right now, Greenwich Village is a completely controlled place. It's very difficult to develop anything at all. Um, you know, whenever you try, the Greenwich Village and Preservation Society, you know, whenever pulls out all these Jane Jacobs passages, and it sort of fulfills it. So I guess I think she's, you know, if I had to choose between one of the two, you know, this smart growth now where you sort of force, you know, or new urbanism where you, you know, kind of force relatively narrow streets, three or four stories, you know, but nothing really much bigger, nothing really much smaller. Um, forcing that as compared to whatever they did in the 1960s, you know, with the highways and uh, the anti-density kind of zoning, I, I would say that right now probably would fit closer to a market ideal. Uh, however, you know, obviously there's a ways to go. So those, those are my thoughts on Jane Jacobs. Right, right. I think um, what it reminds me of, um, in my experience, and I'm sure you probably have similar mechanisms in the States, but whereas in the Robert Moses era, you would have had, through taxation, um, a huge you know, concentration of, of um, urban development going through state processes where you, know, you basically have state-built infrastructure and state-built housing and so forth. Now what you have is a private developer who uses these states to, typically through compulsory purchase, um, who uses the state to acquire larger um, plots of land than they otherwise would do in, in a purely market interaction. So in other words, they, they go to the local authority and they make a deal whereby they will essentially get to extend their property boundary by compulsory purchase of surrounding properties, or what you call in the states eminent do- domain. And then the the flip side of that is that they will then provide what is termed in the UK planning gain, which essentially is, you know, if you let us build this, that and the other, then we will provide um, a bit of park or whatever it is, you know, whatever the local political process, you know, would deem to be a success, you know, so that the local um, political people can say, look what we got, we got a new transit stop or park or this, that, and this, that, and the other. So it's kind of, you know, it looks, when, when, when a development happens, it looks like it's the product of a market process because a, a property developer with their logo on it comes along and builds something. But actually, behind that, everything through from land acquisition through to what they actually build and of course, all of the regulations about what they're able to build that you describe is all very much um, a, a state sort of regulated and, and really um, uh, run process. Does that make sense? It certainly does to me. <laughs> well, you know, the, the, the other thing is that I think, I mean, I, I'm, I'm guilty of uh, wanting to look at the world in, in term in top versus in, in the format of top down versus bottom up. And the world is, of course, much more complicated than that. In all the things that I read about the financial crisis right now, which is going on, I guess, not just in the U.S., but almost everywhere. But whereas uh, most Americans on the right and the left love to talk about separation of church and state, let's say, uh, I'd love to see a separation of Wall Street and state. And the um, the analyses that I see coming out of, you know, what happened in the financial mess in uh, 2000, in the years leading up to 2007, and even beyond, is a, a very, very, in my view, dangerous alliance between Wall Street and Washington. And uh, so it isn't, it isn't proponents of a free market or proponents of top-down uh, 
it's it's people holding hands who really shouldn't be holding hands, but they are because we, we give them that format. Um, I think in the urban biz, we provide a format whereby developers are not eager to take on the regulatory apparatus. Uh, they'll work with the regulatory apparatus as best they can, or if they can, or even as you just mentioned, use the regulatory apparatus and take us away from, from market processes. Um, on, that, on that thought, um, at least in the U.S., I always tell my students there are three migrations that are, are um, very important. One, of course, is a very old one from the, what we call the frost belt to the sun belt. The other is into the suburbs, and the third is into private communities. And many people, of course, do all three at the same time. But I think when people, when there is movement to the suburbs and or into private communities, it's um, both developers and, and, and citizens getting out of the way of traditional, um, almost calcified, uh, big city administrations. So if they have to work with them, they find ways to work with them. But many of them, as, as you point out, but many of them also prefer uh, either uh, private cities or private communities or what uh, Bill Fischel calls home voter communities on the outskirts, where um, you don't have a political, an entrenched political establishment that you have to work with. But of course, if they have to work with them, they can, and you get the kind of outcomes that you just mentioned. Right, right. Yeah, and unfortunately, I mean, going back to the point that you made, Peter, I guess you know you've had this massive link between. Wall Street and, and government that, that has been really um, part of how the whole economic meltdown has happened. But, yep. but for, for most people, what it looks like is capitalism run amok and that now we need to really go in there and super regulate because, um, oh, yes. you know, the market has kind of failed. But I understand yes. also the point that you make about um, kind of moving out to um, private communities, which is an, in a way is the same kind of process, I guess, as manufacturing moving abroad when regulation and, uh, and labor costs become too high within a domestic economy. It's like going, going elsewhere where, where there's less intervention, so to speak. Certainly. Capital and labor are more, more mobile than ever, and uh, there's nothing you can do about it, thank God. Right. But, it, but it is going on, yes. Yeah, hi. This is Stephen. Can I jump in? And I want to talk about the, uh, so the private communities that you know, come out that have sort of been propping up uh, out west in the southwest and places. I guess Texas would be the, the biggest one. Um, you know, these are places out really far away from any metropolitan core, and a lot of the time, you know, you can have an unincorporated county out there, and you don't you don't have to follow many regulations at all. Um, a lot of them out Texas don't have any zoning, but, you know, that that's great for this, you know, to, to let out, you know, sort of a suburban safety valve. However, I guess the problem with that is that, you know, it, it can allow for, you know, people who want to live in suburban environments to escape the state or, you know, escape as much of the state as they can. But, you know, the thing about cities is that it requires a certain amount of agglomeration. It requires a certain amount of um, infrastructure that's just not allowed to be built anymore. I mean, New York City, you could not legally build the elevated trains that they have today. You know, it's just not allowed. So I guess, you know, that that's a great escape for those who want a suburban lifestyle, but there's no real escape for people who want an urban lifestyle. There's no city in America that has, you know, a dense core that you're allowed to build, you know, relatively unlimited the way they did, you know, around the turn of the century. Um, there's nowhere where you're allowed to build an elevated train, even though they're much cheaper than subways. Um, so I guess, the, you know, the problem is finding a, or creating something similar in the U.S. or in some place that already has, that allows urbanism, you know. I guess well, we allow just... suburbanism, but we don't allow urbanism, obviously. Well, let me just respond briefly. I mean, I, I get your point, but um, there is, well, first of all, um, in conventional downtowns, in center cities, you've got now, I believe, hundreds of business improvement districts. And business improvement districts are, I think, analogous. They're a new layer of government or governance, and they're a quite spontaneous um, uh, kind of governance which comes about, or which which comes about because uh, local business people see that conventional government has failed them. Uh, 
So I think that's going on too. And I think the other thing that's going on is that, um, and that's why I mentioned Bill Fischel's Home Voter Cities, that there are a lot of suburban cities which are not necessarily private, but Bill Fischel would say there isn't any difference. They are essentially homeowner controlled. Now, there are issues with that too. But I think that there's, um, there's, there's, a, there's a middle ground, which I think is, is worth thinking about.